As John mentioned, I'm the Director of Technology for the Solid State Lighting and Energy Electronic Center, or SLEEK for short. Uh, the center is an industry-funded center focusing on uh, a couple of different areas in, in GAN-based research, uh, solid state lighting, LEDs and lasers, uh, as well as power electronics, and we have some effort focused on bulk gallium nitride growth. Um, I'll be talking today about laser lighting and visible light communication, so a lot of laser emphasis. Um, but of course, our, a lot of our research started with and still is focused on LEDs. Um, of course, everybody here is probably familiar with all the applications of LEDs and how ubiquitous they've become in areas such as SSL all the way to displays and now in automotive lighting as well. Um, and everybody here, of course, recognizes the energy savings impact, right? So we're looking at 40% you know, electricity savings in the US alone by 2030. Um, which is a huge boon in terms of eliminating the need for, for power plants and avoiding generating greenhouse gases. A light source that's 20 times as efficient as the traditional incandescent. And this uh, was recognized, and I know we've, we've, we've said this a number of times, uh, but we're really, really proud of this particular point. This was recognized by the Nobel Committee last year, uh, and uh, Shuji Nakamura is now UCSB's sixth Nobel winner, um, and he's an integral part of our center. Um, but as much as LEDs are everywhere now, it should be uh, noted that there are still some big challenges uh, in continuing to push this technology forward. Um, and the main thing is, is energy efficiency losses. And typically, you'll have press releases that say, look, we've got 150 lumens per watt. By the time that the LED is in a system, the performance is uh, nearly half that. And the two big things that are driving this our thermal droop, as you drive the LEDs harder uh, and hotter, uh, the efficiency go down. But uh, more insidious, perhaps, is the current droop uh, in an LED chip. As the current density is increased, as you drive them harder in terms of, uh, in terms of input current, the efficiency goes down. And there was a lot of work, as, uh, as John mentioned, here at UCSB on understanding this phenomenon. And recent experiments showed that this is a result of Auger non-radiative recombination. And the reason why this is insidious is because this is potentially inherent, you know, basically a, a inherent property of the material uh, that we need to overcome. Now we've made strides within the center uh, looking at, at dealing with, with this group. Um, what we're calling the second generation LED, which we've been working on now for, I would say, about seven, eight years, uh, is an LED that's instead of growing the gallium nitride on a sapphire or silicon, silicon carbide or silicon substrate, uh, we are growing it on bulk GAN. Um, and what that does, and you can see this in cross-section TMs of two structures, one traditional one grown on sapphire compared to one grown on the native bulk GAN substrate, is that the dislocation density in homoepitaxy is significantly reduced. And what that, what that allows you to do is then take devices and drive them significantly harder uh, and then get more ef efficiency from a smaller area of the chip. So this addresses cost. Uh, here is a comparison of what a typical UCSB chip looks like compared to a traditional high power LED that you might find in the market one by one millimeter. The other things that bulk GAN does um, is that given that it's a conductive substrate, it gives you um, better current flow, right, and a simpler device design. It's also got very good thermal conductivity, and so now you can start to address the thermal droop issues in the material. The other thing that we can do with bulk GAN is instead of working on the traditional C-plane orientation, which is what's common uh, in industry, we can start looking at alternative cuts of the crystal and looking at semipolar uh, and nonpolar devices. And that, what that really does is address the inherent polarization uh, induced losses that you have in the crystal. In C-plane, you typically have uh, quite a bit of polarization inefficiency in terms of the transitions. Uh, when you go to M-plane or semipolar, you can uh, start operating in more of a flat band type situation. Uh, and again, bulk GAN uh, allows you to do this. Um, and we have demonstrated this in the past. I think Steve Denbars has shown this exact plot perhaps in the last year's conference for those who are here. Um, looking at semipolar performance versus a traditional C-plane LED, you can see that out to a much higher current density of operation, you can have improved performance, right? Reduced, reduced droop. Um, but that is still some finite amount of, of droop. And what we're most excited about is what we're calling actually 
the third generation of, of uh, light emitting devices. There's a lot of effort now started in the center looking at this. And that's looking at lasers as a potential pump source instead of LEDs. And uh, Kristen talked a little bit about this this morning for those who were in the industry section. Um, why is this interesting? Well, as I mentioned, LEDs, as you drive them harder, become more inefficient. But with lasers, as soon as you hit threshold uh, performance, uh, or as soon as you hit lasing, your uh, carrier concentration clamps. And what that means is that your OJ non-radiative recombination clamps. And so as you drive a laser harder and harder in terms of current density, you become more and more efficient. Uh, and you can actually get to the point where you're on par uh, equivalency in terms of EQE with LEDs out at much, much higher current densities. And again, the analogy here in terms of why would you want to drive it so hard, well, you can still get away with a much, much smaller chip size driven at much harder uh, conditions, and then you get even more uh, devices per wafer, and I'll show that in a second. Now, this has already uh, piqued the interest of a number of uh, companies looking at applications. Uh, of course, projectors are, are very uh, aligned with what lasers can do in terms of long distance. But also now, automotive uh, has, has picked up laser lighting. Uh, BMW is releasing or just released a car with a laser uh, headlight. Um, because what they're seeing is that with this, type of, with this type of white source, they can get three to four times the distance of projection uh, as compared to an LED solution. So for applications that really involve long throws or, or, or uh, long distance uh, illumination, laser may be particularly interesting. Um, I mentioned, again, the idea of high current density in, in a device. What that effectively translates to is that you can have very, very small devices uh, operating with a lot, you know, emitting quite a bit of power. If you look at, uh, if you look at a laser compared to an LED, you can cram uh, almost six times as many devices on a wafer, right? So your costs go way down. And in terms of the, the wattage out, the blue wattage out, it's orders of magnitudes higher, right? So this, this will target specific metrics that everybody in the industry cares about, which is lumens per watt and dollars per lumen. Um, of course, also as, as Kristen mentioned this morning, the fact that you've got a very, very, very small point source means that your optics design and your heat sink designs could be significantly simplified, and that could let then lead to overall improvements in your in your package efficiency and your package cost. So we've done some uh, preliminary uh, testing, basically taking a commercial blue laser available and combining it in this case with a single crystal phosphor plate uh, and already getting pretty decent efficiencies, but just under 90 lumens per watt with a 500 lumen uh, emission, all from a single diode, right? So this is, this is pretty neat. Um, so uh, CRIs are, can be pretty close, although there's quite a bit of work that we have to do on the phosphor side to, to tune this, right? Um, now, there are still some challenges. And these things that we'll be working on uh, going forward. First thing, of course, is wall plug efficiency. Those who remember the plot I showed at the beginning, that's external quantum efficiency, doesn't take into account the operating voltage. Uh, quite a bit of loss in a laser is due to the high voltage at these high current densities. So this is something we have to work on. I should point out that in the red systems, 70% uh, wall plug efficiency has been achieved. Uh, so we don't see necessarily a reason why we can't get gallium nitride based devices to that level. The other thing to work on, of course, is the phosphors. We need materials that are capable of operating at these incredibly high flux densities. So these, these two things will be active areas of research. Um, we have been pushing the high power uh, laser diode uh, quite a bit, um, working on novel structures such as using uh, I, um, ITO claddings um, and contacts and have been able to achieve uh, just in this last year CW operation. Um, of, of devices, uh, 1.2 watts uh, at uh, just about 17 kiloamps per flux meter. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about another area that's of interest in the center and is getting a lot of uh, interest in the industry, and that's uh, visible light communication. I'll tie this back to lasers in a second. Um, but basically, this is leveraging the the, the light source, uh, modulating the light source to be able to transmit information. And this has been studied as early as uh, in early 2000s uh, in Japan. Uh, now it's actually being called LiFi, commonly called LiFi, uh, 
basically using the white light source to, to do the uh, data transmission. Um, there are certain advantages that Li-Fi offers over the traditional Wi-Fi, in particular in terms of what's the available bandwidth to be able to, to what's the available spectrum for this type of communication, but we should expect much higher data rates uh, available with this, and in particular, it's interesting for security reasons because you're only transmitting in an area where there's the illumination, and so if you're looking to, to tap into that, you have to be in a much smaller area to, 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 to get uh, sort of a, uh, a visibility into what's going on in that communication, so security is pretty good. Um, Another interesting thing is is uh, is the cost, right? Because uh, effectively you have a light source built in. You have a lot of the initial um, hardware already available. Um, applications uh, that are interesting to people um, include uh, medical uh, rooms where you don't want to have your traditional uh, wireless communication due to interference concerns. Uh, of course, in small areas uh, such as uh, airlines, uh, underwater is particularly interesting, um, and of course, trying to make smart museums where now the lighting contains information on the particular thing you're looking at. That is analogous to what GE uh, recently talked about in terms of being able to, to use this to sort of s smartly target uh, customers as they walk through a store, right, where basically particular lights generate information that ties into your cell phone. Um, now, traditionally this has been looked at with LEDs and that does have some a bit of a challenge because uh, the problem with LEDs is due to their large ship size and the carrier lifetimes, you tend to have somewhat of a slow response uh, in terms of how, what, what your gigabit per second data rate can be. Uh, with phosphorus, it makes it particularly difficult, especially when you're trying to then get the blue signal to, for the communication. Uh, there has been some recent progress. Uh, people have demonstrated one gigabit per second uh, transmission rates uh, with LEDs. Using micro LEDs with a much smaller cavity, faster response, they've pushed it to, to three uh, gigabits per second. But if you think about the laser, uh, this type of light source should have much faster modulation uh, available to us because it is a, a much, a much uh, smaller uh, type of emitter. Um, and so just, a, just to show, we've, we've been doing these kind of measurements here, uh, setting up measurement systems to that where none of the uh, elements are, are anywhere near the limits of where we want to get that with, uh, with the, the eventual result. Let me just skip this. Um, sorry, this is the commercial laser which we've used uh, to try to do these kind of uh, system measurements. And we've been getting pretty good results, right? So uh, Cheng Min, the student working on this, showed that he can get uh, up to 2.6 gigahertz of frequency with, uh, with a laser-based uh, VLC um, and data transmissions up to four gigabits per second. So this is much past where we've seen the LED get to. So again, now lasers for lighting, lasers for VLC, we could be looking at a whole new class of, uh, of applications with this particular device technology. So I'll just sum it up here, right? So again, there's still work that we need to do on Droop, right? But lasers could be a, a neat way of going around this problem, um, especially for applications looking at long beams um, and uh, interesting potential tie-in to some of the VLC work. And I want to make sure to acknowledge the SLEEK and SSLP researchers that contributed to this, Arash on the lasers. Kristen and Michael on the, uh, specifically on the laser lighting side, and then Cheng Min on all the work that I showed for VLC. Thanks, any questions?